And um, this is the college in the time of COVID, COVID academic exploration and support session. And um, we're very lucky to be joined by some of our current students and Tara Fisher as well from our Center for Academic Advising, Internships and Lifelong Career Development. Um, so really excited to have them here to talk with you. They'll go through a presentation and introduce themselves and then we'll have time for a question and answer at the end as well. Um, my name is Mary Nolte. I work in the admissions office. So I will be behind the scenes managing the Q&A. If you have questions as we go, feel free to type them into there and we'll save some time at the end to answer those for you as well. So once again, welcome and I'll turn it over to Tara for some introductions. Thank you, Mary. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I'm going to, in just a moment, introduce some of my uh, very esteemed students to you. And what we'd like to do during this time is to talk with you a little bit about ac academic exploration and success at Dickinson, both in the time of COVID-19 and also um, outside of the time of COVID-19. And many of the things we'll talk about today will have a lot of application um, in both scenarios. So um, just as a, a quick bit of uh, intro for me, again, it's Tara Fisher. I'm the Dean of Academic Advising. I work in the Center for Advising Internships and Lifelong Career Development. It's a mouthful, um, but I also am a Dickinson graduate and just absolutely thrilled with the things that we have in place and um, the systems and structures that the college is uh, put into place to support students again during this time and during or what would we say, I guess, normal or previous and future times. Um, I am joined today by two students and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. Um, after they introduce themselves, I'll do a little bit of a presentation and then we'll hear some student stories, then talk a bit, a bit more um, and then move into Q and A. So without further ado, uh, how about Robin? You wanna go first? Sure. So hello everyone, my name is Robin. I am a senior here at Dickinson. I'm originally from Atlanta. I am an environmental studies and philosophy double major here. I'm also one of the peer advisors in the Career Center or Center for Advising Internships and Lifelong Career Development. Um, but some other things that I do on campus include the Black Student Union, Trendsetters, which is a club for first generation college students. Um, and I'm also in Hypnotic, which is the only hip hop dance you on campus. Hi guys, um, I'm Jordan. I'm also a senior. Um, I'm a chemistry major. I'm originally from St. Pete, Florida, um, so pretty far away. Um, on campus, I'm a peer tutor. I'm also a peer advisor with Robin and um, I'm involved in undergraduate research in chemistry. Well, thank you both. I'm going to go ahead and start a quick presentation here. And give me just one moment. Get this going. So really we have the opportunity to talk with you today about a couple different things. And I really, I guess the underlying goal for this is we wanna talk with you about the ways that we approach helping you as students identify and confirm or identify and or confirm and then pursue your authentic interest. That's a term you're going to hear me talking a lot about during our presentation today and hopefully will be really well illustrated through the conversations or the discussions that our students will provide. Um, really two big takeaways for this. We want to make sure that you understand what it would look like to begin a, a academic exploration at Dickinson and really helping you find that what that it is that you're really interested in or confirm it if you think that you know what you'd like to do already. And we also wanna talk about the academic support along the way and how oftentimes along the way um, for good or for bad or for completely you know, unplanned reasons, things may come up and we've got you, we've got you covered no matter what um, as we prepare you for an ultimate launch. So really, really wanna focus a lot on the academic exploration want to focus a lot on the support systems and structures that are in place as you navigate your Dickinson experience. So I included this slide because to me this is just sums up <laughs> exactly where we're at right and how life oftentimes turns out. Um, it really is important for from a Dickinson perspective to prepare our graduates to be nimble. Um, we 
we ask people to think about uh, using their, their education in many flexible ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But before I do, I just, I wanna ask a kind of a way back when question. And I'd like you to think back onto maybe the very first thing that you as a, as a child remember wanting to do or to be. And for some of us, those are things that have stayed the exact same throughout the experience and throughout kind of from then to now. But for most of us, that's changed a lot. I certainly know it did for me. I uh, was absolutely in love with a fast food restaurant's recipe. And at that particular time, I wanted to work at that fast food restaurant for the rest of my life just to, to learn the recipe, five-year-old me. So uh, really, when we think about the importance of having support systems along the way and people to have good conversations with and kind of ask tough questions of us and both challenge and support us along the way, it's really huge. Um, again, some people may know exactly what they want to do, and that never changes. But for a lot of us, we, we do have changes along the way. And what we really want to make sure we do is we prepare students for just not the first job, but for the second, third, fourth, however many jobs or careers they may have along the way. That is a quintessential Dickinson goal. Um, I was recently reading an article and saw Futurist are now predicting that by 2030, 85% of the jobs that will exist are completely unimagined by now, 2030. That's not that far along away. Uh, so really in everything that we do and in the questions that we ask and the things that we encourage students to uh, really think about and then apply, we're preparing for that. We're preparing for this reality that we really can't predict at this point. Um, we've also along the way, I think developed really uh, very pragmatic and um, fun and accessible kind of steps and processes to help both from an academic and a career development standpoint. So our goal really is to help students identify and confirm and identify and, and confirm and then pursue their authentic interest, both inside and out of the classroom, um, on campus and off campus, during and after Dickinson. And um, really, in order to do that, we have to ask a series of questions. Um, if our goal is to help students identify and confirm and then pursue our, their authentic interests, that sounds pretty simple, but really there are very uh, complex questions that underlie that. Um, not, not at least the uh, really relationship between a Dickinson education and the liberal arts and sciences and a student's future career. Uh, that's something that we know that is on most families' mind, most students' mind, and is very much on our mind as well. Uh, so we ask a lot of questions, many, many questions. Um, and that oftentimes leads us to many of the things that you can kind of see on the screen. Um, but from decades of experience, we know that students' program of study does not determine their future career options. Um, people launch into almost anything from almost anything. But we do take the academic decision very, very serious, very, very seriously. We ask lots of questions. Um, we ask questions like, what topics uh, spark your curiosity? Or what kinds of problem solving strategies do you find most satisfying? Uh, what kind of evidence do you find most compelling? Those are the types of questions that you will have conversations with advisors, with other people along the way as you navigate your Dickinson experience. So now we get into the really fun part for me. Um, so an introduction to Dickinson's advising experience overall, I want to make sure that you understand what this would actually look like, whether in COVID or um, beyond. So when everyone's in person. So as an introduction to the Dickinson advising experience, I really want to talk about this being absolutely core to academic exploration for us. Uh, so each student works with a faculty member um, from the moment that really you enroll at Dickinson. Um, all the way up until when you graduate. Uh, first year seminar professors are your advisor when you first start. And then uh, that later on when you declare your major, that would turn into an advisor within the field that you were choosing to study in. We, before students even begin on campus um, over the summer or during the middle of the fall, if you're starting in the spring, we work with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis 
and we um, and we do we call it new student advising or summer advising depending on when it's happening and we um, really ask a lot of questions during that time frame that begin to help you hopefully reflect on what it is that you're interested in and also begin to see how those interests might map to Dickinson's curriculum so there are 40 plus majors and certificate programs and minor possibilities at Dickinson and so it can be a bit overwhelming uh, really the the goal and the purpose of an advising conversation before you arrive on campus is to help you make sense of that, um, to help you begin to understand the, the true breadth and depth of a liberal arts experience and curriculum, and then to map that, as I mentioned a second ago, onto the specific classes that you would need or should consider for the fall. Um, okay, so at Dickinson, we keep it pretty simple. One class equals one credit. That's four classes per semester during the time that you're here. Um, for a total of 32 courses. And about a third of those courses are within uh, typically a student's major. About a third are our distribution requirements, so the core liberal arts experience there. And then the additional third are electives. And so there's a lot of room for exploration. So during conversations, especially during new student advising, uh, the faculty member that you're working with will ask questions that help you begin to think about which type of path best describes you at that time. There are some students that know exactly what they want to study. Uh, there are other students who have narrowed it down to two or three fields uh, that may be of interest to them. And then there are others that are completely wide open and ready for exploration, just as, as wide as possible. And all three of those paths are great. I think you'll probably hear, I believe both Robin and Jordan had a little bit of different routes to finding their majors and the things that they were really passionate about studying academically. So I hope that that will be illustrated in just a few moments. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think uh, you will work with your first year seminar professor until you declare your major uh, as a student at Dickinson. And you have until the end of your sophomore year to declare that major. So lots of time to begin to explore, but also in a very focused way. So along the way, you're oftentimes working through distribution requirements and um, hopefully exploring things that are of interest to you that help either cross things off the list or um, help you be even more confident in the choice that you're making. Okay, I mentioned a couple, a couple of times that term authentic interest. So I wanna explain a bit more about what we think that means at Dickinson and, and how that influences the advising experience and the work that you do with our center and other, other folks across campus, really. So for us, authentic interest is that sweet spot between, between where your personality, skills, priorities, and values intersect. And for us, that finding that spot is, is what's gonna be the thing, hopefully, that you're excited about for a really, really long time. Um, and oftentimes what we see in working with students is there may actually be some type of fundamental uh, kind of almost gap between the way that uh, students might oftentimes look at something. So if, uh, for example, I began a career right after I graduated from Dickinson that I really wasn't the best fit for me, although it was meeting some priorities that I had, it wasn't the best fit for me because at my core relationships really mattered and I was in a role where that wasn't necessarily aligning. And so our job and the work that we do with you from an advising standpoint and from a really a career development standpoint as well is to find the place where all of those things really line up. And we can talk a bit more about that um, later if you have questions. So all of this that I've just spoken about really flows in and into and through our career development model. And so this is where you begin to see the academic advising experience and your career development experience begin to, to mesh during your time at Dickinson. So you can see uh, on this, I guess, figure, assess, explore, experience, launch, assess, explore, experience, launch. Those are the four main areas that we really feel like are important for students to uh, begin to work through, to begin to uh, think through, knowing that reflect and decide is at the core of that model. And as you'll notice, that is a, a kind of never ending, you know, assess, explore, experience, launch um, model. And that's intentional because we know that this will be a lifelong process as you 
learn different things um, and decide, you know, maybe you are very interested in completely different things than you necessarily were as a 17 or 18 year old, you know, when you're say 40 or so. So I say all of that about the, the kind of the philosophy that we approach advising and career development from because it's going to be really important for you to keep those things in mind as you're thinking about the types of college opportunities that you want. And at Dickinson, we're very, very intentional about com really combining those two. Um, speaking of experiences, and a few moments ago as I was talking about that, that kind of cog or gear model, there, the experiences from our perspective are really what help students can take things off the table or put them back on the table. And you'll hear a little bit about this in a few moments when Robin and Jordan are speaking. Um, academic research and internships are really a huge part for all, a huge variety, a huge number, excuse me, a huge majority of our students uh, in terms of what they experience. And I think you'll hear in both of their stories how that internship or that undergraduate research experience really did shape the path that they've gone into and onto. And that's very, very common for us. And so we put a lot of effort, energy, and resources behind supporting internships and undergraduate research opportunities for this very reason. That's, those are just a couple of examples of the types of things that a student would experience when they're here. For those of you who have attended other panels today and over the last couple of days, you know that there are you know, 100 plus clubs and organizations on campus and many, many things uh, that I just won't go into during this particular um, session that really all line up into that experience category. So I'm going to stop for just a few minutes and I'm going to ask Jordan and Robin to share a bit more about the experience that they had, especially from an academic exploration standpoint. Uh, so um, I don't know who wants to go first. Do I? Uh, maybe Robin. Uh, I, what I'd like for both of you to do is tell us a little bit about how you got from 17 or 18 year old you looking at colleges to now and maybe, you know, some of the experiences or people or interactions that happened that really influenced that along the way. Robin? Yeah, sure. Um, so everyone, like I mentioned, I'm a double major. I'm an environmental studies and philosophy double major. Um, and coming into Dickinson, I chose Dickinson for the sustainability program. So I knew I wanted to do something environmental related when I came into college, but I just wasn't sure what that was going to be. Um, so I had my advising call with my first year seminar professor, um, and my first year seminar was a philosophy class, um, but it was called The Persistence of Racism, and I didn't really connect the dots at the time, um, but basically it was a class about the metaphysics of race and racism in the world, which was way beyond my like 17 year old head could really wrap my mind around at the time. Um, but when I was having my advising call with my with my advisor slash professor at the time, he was like, well, why don't you just take something that, you know, you think you'd be interested in It's your first semester. So don't take anything too serious because you're still exploring. So I took my first year seminar and I took the requirement for um, the first year requirement for the environmental studies slash science major because I wasn't sure which one yet. And I then took American government. Um, which was a poli sci class. And then I took logic, which was another philosophy class. Um, and I, I took that so that I could fulfill my QR distribution requirement. And I thought that was going to be easier than calculus. And I was, it's not, but, um, and so I, I really enjoyed logic and I really enjoyed my first year seminar. And I was talking with my advisor again about classes for a spring semester. And he's like, well, why don't you take, you know, take the next thing for environmental studies since you're sure about that. Um, and maybe something else in environmental studies to get you more into the department so you can know more about what there is for you to offer. Um, so I took environmental and social justice, which was an amazing class for me and basically sparked my understanding of how I could combine environment, the environmental studies aspect of it and philosophy. Because uh, at the same time that semester, I also took moral problems, which was a philosophy ethics class. And so I sort of connected the dots at that time. And it made sense to me that I wanted to work in environmental justice, environmental activism, things like that. And it was all because my first year seminar professor was, a, he worked in the philosophy department. And so he kind of just tricked me 
And um, at the end of my freshman year, he was like, it seems like your favorite classes this year have been philosophy classes. And just so you know, you've completed the first year requirements for the major. And so I was like, wow, I see what you did there. Um, but it was actually really, really helpful. And as I've continued on with figuring out that I wanna do environmental justice, I've done a number of different internships and programs um, where I've gotten to do different things. So I did one where I sort of worked in marketing and I realized I didn't wanna do marketing. Um, and then I did an internship where I got to compose toolkits for, for activists age 11 to 18. So basically I was working with kids who wanted to start their environmental campaigns, but just needed a little help writing grants, uh, meeting their local law legislators, things like that. And so that kind of hands-on experience, I was like, yeah, I really like that. So um, I gained guidance with my future careers through those internships and those experiential learning things. Um, and that's all because of the help that I got from my academic advisor and sort of just letting go and picking those classes for the first first year of my college experience and not being too bound down to one thing or another, like trying to take classes so that I could get a job later. I really just took what I wanted to take. Um, but through that, learned more about what I was actually, what my authentic interest was. Um, so that's sort of my story up to now. Um, I, my future plans, I guess I can talk about that now, um, will I'll be applying for a fellowship in January um, to work with the Ocean Conservancy. So that's what I'm planning to do. Um, obviously that's, uh, January seems like a long time away from now, um, but that's what I'm planning to do with the future and sort of go into policy and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about my journey here at Dickinson. Thank you, Robin. Of course. Um, Jordan, could you please tell us a bit about, you know, how you got from 17 or 18 year old you to now? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I remember in high school, I've always kind of been drawn to math and science and the kind of STEM like problem solving where there's a definite answer and you can like logic your way through it. Um, but I remember I was taking like um, AP chemistry and my teacher left halfway through the semester so we were stuck like watching videos and I just like I was like yep chemistry is too hard like this is not what I want to be doing it's like just too difficult and I don't like it so I went into college I had been planning on like doing chemistry or STEM but I was like I think I'm going to pivot do business but like as I was talking to my advisor about it over the summer they were like it seems like you really liked chemistry before that like maybe just like hop in the first semester class and see what happens. And then I like enrolled in econ. I took Italian because I really wanted to go abroad and like eat pasta really. That's why I picked it. Um, but I know like I had taken Latin in high school and like to me, it wasn't seeming very useful besides like for English words. So I wanted to really like become fluent and speak a language. Um, I also took my first year seminar, which was um, home and belonging as an immigrant in 21st century America. And my professor for that, she was wonderful. She encouraged me to take other US diversity classes, which were, um, that's one of our requirements. Um, yeah, and it was very interesting. I also took violin because that's something I've been doing since I was very little. But um, yeah, so as I took the chemistry class, I had a wonderful professor and we did labs and hands-on things. And I just realized like, this is something I could actually do. Like I just had a bad experience earlier. Um, so I decided to keep going and take like the math classes that were necessary because they also like overlapped with other things I was considering. Um, and then, yeah, I was kind of just like good with chemistry from then. Um, one of the reasons I did choose Dickinson is because the science building is amazing and the professors are so great. When I toured the first time, um, like I had a professor like take me aside and like show me little experiments and like talk to me personally with the student and that connection that I had with them like really encouraged me to see that like there was a strong science community even at Dickinson. Um, and because there were so little like the student to faculty ratio, like it's a liberal arts school. Um, I got to start doing undergraduate research sophomore year. So I just went to one of my professors and I said, 
hey, I really liked your class. Can I, I could see myself maybe doing something like this. Is there a way I could join your lab? And she was like, yes, like, please do. And so I got my foot in the door that way. And then I got to do an internship um, in nanomaterials, which I like never, it just sounds so hard. It was so difficult, like out of my comfort zone, like so technical. And I did that at Rutgers after applying like with Dickinson and with the support of the Career Center and my professors who like wrote me recommendation letters and helped me with everything. Um, and so, yeah, and now I've been doing research ever since I've been in two different labs at Dickinson. Um, I'm even on campus right now because I petitioned to continue doing research in person. So I'm one of like probably a hundred students that had various reasons for being here. Um, so yeah, and I really feel like the whole chemistry department is like, I feel like they're all my advisors at this point. They've all like, like I'm presenting an honors thesis and like they all give me feedback and are so supportive. And I feel like that's one of the like biggest bonuses I got from Dickinson was this sort of like career exploration in the beginning, but then also the like sense of community and support that I gained from just like being able to walk through the department and like any faculty member will like ask me about my research or like, how's it going or what's happening. Um, okay, so future plans. I will be going to graduate school. I don't know where yet because I have to do some applications, but um, possibly Columbia or Yale. And yeah, I'll be doing nanotechnology and like nanochemistry. So something that I thought was just for like engineering students who would be at a, like a very technical school is something that like I'm now doing, which is not where I would have expected myself to be. Thank you, Jordan. And both of these students are incredibly humble. I mean, I, I know Robin is gonna be next semester, a part of our Baird Sustainability Fellowships Program, which is a, a huge honor. Uh, Jordan uh, was in, elected into Phi Beta Kappa in the fall and all kinds of other accolades. Uh, so really two incredible uh, stories here. I want to say just from a re realistic standpoint, it doesn't always look like this, right? Um, we have two students who have really figured out what they want to do, uh, but oftentimes along the way, there are a lot of kind of bumps in the road or twists and twists and turns that might make students, you know, wonder, you know, do I fit? Is this something that I am able to even do? And so uh, kind of segueing over into the academic support area, uh, I, I just want to, again, going to quickly share my screen here. Um, I just want to, uh, of course, I'm beginning. Okay. Want to talk through a few of the really strong resources and programs across campus that are there to both challenge and support students, uh, no matter what your goals are. Um, and so these, these, I guess, or the different groups or various offices or programs that I have listed here really offer a huge range of support for students. And uh, from really from early on proactive identification of early alerts or early excellence students, just a couple weeks into students first year, and then, you know, roll call grades and various checkpoints along the way, we are very intentional and very proactive about helping students who may be struggling a bit or may really be taken off and making sure that we are helping provide students who are really in either of those kind of camps the types of opportunities that will really help them meet their academic goals and make for uh, the most ideal experience at Dickinson that's possible. Uh, so I, I will be happy to answer questions about any of these programs, any of these areas. Jordan, Robin, are there any in particular, any things that, that you all have been involved with or would like to talk a bit about, maybe to kind of promo a couple areas? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I've both like attended sessions and been the tutor for peer tutoring within Dickinson. So I've been a one-on-one -on -one tutor with students. I've done 
So like I've attended when I was a first year, the group chemistry tutoring. Um, and I now I'm a tutor for it actually. Um, but yeah, I know definitely throughout the STEM and like QR, which is quantitative reasoning, there's a lot of support both for people, students in the major, and then also students just trying to fill the quantitative reasoning or lab distribution requirements. Um, so I'm involved with the Quantitative Reasoning Center, which is kind of like a place you can drop in and get like targeted quantitative reasoning help, whether it's how to like use Excel to make graphs or do this just statistical analysis or in chemistry, how to do this like math. It's really there to like help guide students and especially if you can target it early on so you can get those skills, it's really helpful later on. Robin, are there any you want to mention? I can speak briefly about the writing center because I go there often. Um, a lot of times when you take your first year seminar, it'll be required for you to go to the writing center at least once um, because they want you to know how to use it and the fact that it's there. But I actually find it really helpful for things other than school. So um, I might app um, my applications that I submit for things, I will take those to the writing centers because usually they require some kind of personal statement or um, philosophy papers. A lot of times I'll have people look at my arguments or thesis and the writing center is also, it's also multilingual. So if you have a, a paper for a, a language class, like they, you can take those to the writing center as well. So I think it's really very multifaceted and super helpful for anything that you have going on to have. It's always better to have someone else look at your paper, but these are like writing fellows who are very um, good, strong writers and they're good at grammar and stuff like that. So I, I use the writing center a lot. Thank you both. Yeah, I, I really think the takeaway here is from an academic support standpoint, um, we strive to be very proactive and very intentional about really meeting students where they are and helping them, as I mentioned before, reach the goals that they have academically and that we have for them academically too and outside of the classroom. Um, I'm just going to really briefly just put this up for a second. These are some of the things that we do within the Center for Advising Internships and Lifelong Career Development, a wide, wide variety of things. Uh, but this is really, part of the college's plan. Our center is part of the college's plan to, to help students understand all of the things that you're doing as a Dickinsonian really flow together into skills that you are taking forward into whatever it is that you'd like to do after college. I'm gonna just very briefly, because I know that we're running a little bit short on time, I wanna make sure that we get to some questions. I'm gonna really say, again, our big focus is on helping you figure out, your identify and confirm and then pursue those authentic interests. And being ready for launch is a big part of that. Um, we work with students from, a, I guess, more of a skill and also a tangible um, kind of direction to make sure that we uh, have students who are polished and are confident in telling their story about what it is that they did at Dickinson and why they did it. So these are just a few examples of the types of things that we might do when we're working with students. We break all of this down into very kind of step-by-step -step, bite sized pieces. And so when we begin working with students after um, they have begun, after they've enrolled at Dickinson, uh, we meet with them during orientation and each first year student is assigned uh, what we call a launch technician, uh, which is through again our center for advising internships and lifelong career development. And I'll talk a, just for a moment about that in a, a second, but those, those launch technicians and the rest of the staff around us within the center are kind of being, I would say, case managers of, of, of type, just to make sure that students are engaging with things along the way that we think could be helpful to them, that we are uh, maybe promoting programs or opportunities that we think could be specifically tailored to things that they've said that they're interested in uh, and or helping them expand their interest a bit if that's something that they've uh, said they're interested in. So what we do is each year there's a pathway. Usually it's two steps. For some students they want to get ahead and so there are additional steps but we what we do is we really work to meet students where they're at in terms of all of this and the types of things that that we're really um, encouraging students to do along the way. 
we do this because we want to make sure that people are ready by their senior year to feel very confident in kind of next steps, um, whatever those might be. Again, just real quickly, Launch Tech is a new position over the last, I'd say, uh, six months or so. This was something that the college decided we were going to move to. And I am really excited about it. As I mentioned a second ago, it is pretty much like a, a person who's a, a case manager of sort that does all of the things that you can kind of see on the screen right now, but really helping suggest opportunities for students inside and outside the classroom, helping students depending on what year they're in and as they progress through each year, um, continue to clarify what it is that they wanna do and clarify with confidence um, how they're gonna do it and where they're gonna do it. Again, happy to answer any questions that y'all might have about that. I'm gonna stop right now and um, Mary, I believe that there have been maybe some questions come in. Um, do you have some questions for us? I do, yeah, we had a couple of questions and one general question just about the, the distribution requirements at Dickinson and sort of the general curriculum outside of the major requirements. I did include the link in my response in there for the chat so that you can see the full list. And I know that we already talked a little bit about first year seminar, um, but Tara, I'm wondering if you can just quickly talk about those requirements and, and how you approach those from an academic advising standpoint. Thank you, yeah, great question. So as I mentioned really quickly earlier before, about a third of the requirements that a student will take to satisfy degree requirements are distribution requirements, so that core liberal arts. That ranges from things like humanities, arts, lab science, quantitative reasoning, social science, um, things that probably are a bit expected uh, at liberal arts college, to things like U.S. diversity, which is really uh, encouraging and pushing students to think about issues of race, class, and gender within the United States and the implications that um, whatever the topic is um, might have on issues of race, class, and gender within the United States. We have a US, we have a global diversity, excuse me, global diversity requirement. So looking at things through a non-Western lens. And there are several other requirements. I won't go into all of those. I know we don't have a ton of time there, but the point of all of these requirements is to help you begin to see different ways or different lenses through which uh, a problem might be solved. And as both, I think, Robin and Jordan illustrated, oftentimes along the way, you'll take a distribution requirement that piques an interest that you maybe didn't even know existed or really helps you begin to ask questions about the thing that you didn't know existed before. Typically, when we're working from an advising standpoint, we encourage students to not think about the distribution requirements as a checklist. We want people to take classes that they're interested in, especially that first year, because it's really important for some majors to decide what it is that you wanna do earlier on. So our philosophy is really to help you keep as many options on the table for as long as it is that you want to have those options on the table. And so uh, if you were, even gesturing interest towards maybe some of the more hierarchical or structured majors during your first year, then we would guide you towards taking those courses while also maybe doing a distribution requirement or two along the way. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's a bit more. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tara. Um, and like I said, you can check out that um, the link that I sent will list all of those requirements that Tara mentioned too, but a helpful pr perspective for why we have those and how they fit into our school's values as well. Um, we had an additional question for Robin in particular um, about her experience on campus, especially as a young woman of color and what that's been like for you in terms of academic support and other resources on campus. And um, so I'd love it if you could take a little bit to share some of your experience with the group. Sure. So um, when I, I wasn't expecting, to be completely honest, I wasn't expecting a lot from the POC community at Dickinson just because I knew it was such a small school. And um, it, it's like, you know, it just, just have these expectations coming in. But the POC community was so strong and united and powerful. And I think um, I was pleasantly surprised by that. So when I came into Dickinson, I didn't feel that isolation or anything that I was expecting expecting to feel. Um, 
So like one of the first clubs I joined was the BSU because I just targeted that as a place where I knew I could sort of start getting to know people and maybe learn a little bit more about Dickinson and what support they have for the students of color, um, what ways you can sort of work with the administration as a student of color if there's something that um, either you would like to change or you're unhappy about. So I think um, my journey at Dickinson started with the BSU. Um, and then I found Fruit, which is um, a club specifically for women of color. Um, and so Fruit is uh, basically the BSU, but more specified for a, the female experience at Dickinson. Um, so we, we sort of match womanism and um, social justice and things like that, along with also being a woman of color. Um, we have the Women of Color Summit, which was started, um, the inaugural one was last year before last last year? Uh, yeah, year before last in the spring. And um, that's a really amazing thing um, that we do over a weekend. And basically we get alumni to come in and they will give talk about, um, you know, resources that they got from Dickinson to go into their career fields, talking about what it's like to be a woman of color in whatever industry they're in. Um, so that has a lot of helpful resources and also networking opportunities for women of color. Um, it's open to everyone, obviously, but it's focused on the experience of women of color. Um, and then I would say like the, throughout my time here, it's a lot of support has come from the relationships that I've built. So my best friend and I, we live together now. And um, a, lot of, a lot of my time here was just sort of leaning on her. And if there was ever a time where like, especially I'm the only black girl in the environmental studies major too. So like there are lots of times where like you can feel isolated or you can feel like, oh, I feel like all eyes are on me in this room right now. Um, and so leaning on those meaningful relationships that you make at Dickinson is so important because I do believe that everyone sort of finds their person here. And so I've really leaned on the relationships I have with my guy friends and my best friend and stuff like that um, as another sort of big resource for me. Um, and then I, I sort of take my role in the peer advisor and the Center for Advising Internships and Lifelong Career Development as a way to sort of give back to people at Dickinson um, and like being a woman of color in that office and maybe broadening horizons to people who had no idea about what the center does or stuff like that. So I like to, um, you know, we've done programming with the um, mandatory, which is for all the men of color. Um, we did, uh, there was a trendsetters meeting the other day, trendsetters is for first generation college students. Um, so really like expanding and giving back to all the organizations on campus um, and helping out and those, that's what I like as my role in a, as a peer advisor. So it's been a good experience overall. Um, definitely not what I expected coming in, but in a good way. And I feel like I've grown a lot. I feel like I've gotten lots of great opportunities and met some really cool people throughout my time here. So um, overall, you know, pretty good. Hopefully I answered the question. That's great. Thank you, Robin, for sharing. That was great. Um, we have time to just wrap up with one final question, which is the last one in the Q&A. Um, and it, this one is for Jordan. So um, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about it. Um, the question is, what support and resources have you received as you head towards graduate school after graduating from Dickinson? Okay, yeah. Um, so I remember, so my mom is a physics professor um, at a liberal arts school for some context. So I kind of have that like family history of like going to grad school. So when I was like a kid or like even going to college, I was like, nope, not for me. Like, I'm not doing that. Like, that's my mom's thing. Like, mm -mm. and then there was like a like panel or like a um, talk at the career center that I got an email about. It was like, if you're even thinking about grad school or like interested at all, maybe like come to this and see what's up. Um, so I decided to just come and sit through it and like, that kind of like got me thinking like, maybe I could do this. Maybe this could be something that I'd be interested in. And then after my internship, um, after a sophomore year with doing research in like a college setting that I was working with a graduate student and me, like we were just in the lab doing stuff together um, under like a professor, kind of just like the graduate school environment. I realized that like, I did want to go to graduate school. Um, and since then, I've had so much support from the Career Center, but also from like the chemistry department faculty, more specifically, um, and the opportunities that I've gotten from research at Dickinson have 
like made me such a strong applicant. Um, yeah, I got a fellowship that I applied to that's like the most prestigious fellowship um, for like science undergraduate researchers going to grad school. Um, and that wouldn't have been possible if like my professors hadn't like told me to apply for it and like written me recommendation letters and like reviewed all my documents. So like going into applications for grad school, I have so many materials already prepared because like they made me start the chemistry writing early and like talking about myself in like an application way early. So I think, yeah, that's been the biggest like support that I've received. And that actually is one of our strategies is to start working with students very early um, to help continue to develop confidence in, in their what and, and in the why um, and then how and where you're going to use it, right? So that's a, a great example. Jordan, what's the name of that fellowship that you received? Um, the Goldwater. Goldwater, okay. Thank you very much. Mary, are we at time? Yeah, we are at time, unfortunately, but it's been a great, almost an hour with everyone. So thank you again, everyone for joining. A big thank you again to our panelists. This was super helpful to hear from you, Tara, as well as you, Robin and Jordan, for the current student perspective. So I know our attendees really appreciate that. Um, I did put my email address in the chat for you. So if you have additional questions that we weren't able to get to, please feel free to email me. Again, I work in the admissions office. My name is Mary Nolte, and I'd be happy to connect you with any of the panelists as well for some follow-up. So best approach would probably be just to email me. And um, once again, thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right, thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.